Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you to all the scholars, the students, and the faculty assembled here for our weekly research forum meet. Our uh, speaker today is Mr. Joseph Shivo Korovel, and he will be speaking on Heideggerian, appropriating Heideggerian academics in literature, hermeneutics, and phenomenology. Heidegger is a very interesting philosopher because uh, while his philosophy is practical in many ways, this man also insisted on you know, coining very complicated terms to describe very specific concepts that we had in mind. So I'm interested to see what Mr. Shibu has to say about these things. Please welcome him to the stage. You prefer the language English, right? Yeah, certainly there are people who can't understand Malayalam. We have a foreign scholar. Oh, yeah. Foreign scholar, plus the, even our HO, he doesn't understand English. Because maybe an instrumental cause. Why there is a table? Because an instrumental cause. 
okay, carpenter. Why there is a word? Maybe there can be a guard. There can be a possibility of guard because it is being caused. There is one answer. Okay, Aristotle thought, and you learn everything. Every little thing in uh, you have idea of tragedy, you have idea of emotions, you have idea of anything, even the whole science, the, ex uh, the existing science is, you know, based on this particular principle. One is causality, second thing is downwardness. And you have learned this downwardness on the uh, I mean, gravity, probably gravity, or the chemical reactions. Why there are chemical reactions? Because all the elements have the tendency to be in the rest. All uh, inside it comes from Aristotle. So there's a second idea. And thirdly, it comes from Descartes. Descartes answered, why there is something rather than nothing? The answer would be, I think, therefore I exist. Vegeto, Erbazonos, that is, I think, that's Aristotle, and no. I think, therefore, fine. It's good. Cool. Uh, that's with Descartes. Another narrative comes from Hegelian narratives. And which are corrupted by Gator, leftist academics. In Hegelian narrative, in Hegelian narrative, you should know there are right Hegelians, left Hegelians, middle Hegelians. In the left Hegelians, you have Max, Karl Marx, and in Marxism, you have several other theories and so on, and all narratives, you know, feminism, all kind of isms, all things, etc. This is a Hegelian left, it's a minor, a kind of minor idea of Hegelian narrative, okay? That's Hegelian. Then comes, uh, you have uh, independent narratives in uh, Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein is based on language. Fine. And then comes the seminal thinker of uh, uh, this century, that is Heidegger. Heidegger has a narrative. Heidegger changed the entire question. It all, I think, therefore I am. No, no, no. To think, you should be there first, right? To think, you should be there first. Uh, think, uh, existence comes first. Existence. What's the implications? So you have a French romanticism. And French kind of Derrida or Zart or Alan Badiou or so on, so they kind of inferior species. According to Heidegger, all the French intellectualism is a kind of an inferior species, and it's an inferior interpretation of Heideggerian idea of existence. We should be clear about that. Uh, does, does he mean the French intellectuals who were living at his time, or a anybody borrowed his ideas? Anybody who borrowed his ideas. Primarily, it began with Zart. Because Heidegger wrote being and time, and Zart being and nothingness, Alan Badiou being and uh, kind of uh, 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 even being and even Alan Badiou, or uh, anybody who spoke, anybody who spoke. Uh, I mean, there's uh, Judith Butler. Actually, all of them take their ideas. Uh, Foucault. All of them take ideas from Heidegger. Definitely, they don't give a footnote. Two things. I'm a Christian priest, and in our own academics, we can we can uh, it's not uh, we are not asked to call Heidegger because he has a Nazi connection, but we call everything from Heidegger. Same with Judith Butler and everyone. He had a Nazi connection, so that uh, nobody gives a footnote. But you cannot think, you know, anything outside Heidegger. That's a condition now. And especially uh, when I speak on Heidegger, you may feel that oh, this only this much because you are, you are all very much into the Heideggerian academics. So you should understand these are the several narratives, okay? Several narratives. So I'll give you an example of how it works. Okay. If you take one, why uh, narrative before entering into the why narratives are important? You can analyze a text based on several narratives. So if I take Hegelian narrative, Heg why there is enough. In Hegelian narrative, okay, I'll come to the Thora, the Judaic rest of Thora. When we analyze the Hegelian narrative, it clearly emerges an idea. There is a source of Yahvist, Elohist, Deuteronomy, Priestly. These are the sources, okay. In this Yahvist, we ascribe Shakespeare, Kafka, okay, and the origins of the uh, book of Genesis. Because they are the original process of thinking, original occurrence of thought, that is clearly told in Yahvist tradition. It's a Hegelian narrative, not a Maxian narrative. Again, uh, Maxian narrative, I'll tell you, okay. Okay, yeah. Then a Lohist, it's again the very idea occurrence of interpreting prophetic narratives, prophetic literature. We have, you know, when you come to George Orwell and so on, we often got a law. Then Deuteronomist, Deuteronomistic idea, law, constitutional literatures, or all those literatures comes from Deuteronomist. Then come priestly literature. Priestly literature, a deterministic literature, very ordered literature, poetic, all those syntactic.
Jackson and everything comes from. And this is actually the product of Hegelian narrative. When it comes to the phenomenological narrative, we cancel out everything. We say this is bullshit. Simple. Because it is a different narrative. Okay. So what I want to tell you, when I say something in phenomenological narrative, don't compare it with the leftist academics. Don't compare it with uh, Hegelian narrative. It's a complete different category altogether. That's what the primary thing. Secondly, yes, I told you, you should have an idea of language. Okay. We have several ideas of language, I know, but before entering into it, uh, when I refer to the idea of language, it's not a post structuralist idea, it's neither a kind of a constructivist idea, or you know, uh, it's kind of a hermeneutic idea. So, let me tell you what it is. There are three types of language one is the human reality, language, okay, language, one is human reality, addressing human reality, then divine reality. Then bird as a history. Okay. Bird as a history. I want to see water. The AC is very. Okay. Then, in the human reality, the idea of I mean, bird have three. You know, idea of language has three dimensions. Suddenly the elder one comes. I 
have given all my blessings to the other one. Uh, why it happens? He could have already said, oh, he cheated me, so you take out now. He can't say. Once the word is given by an individual, it's uh, the very near way, then the, uh, the very Torah, Torah is there. Okay, fine. Torah means, uh, Torah this is again, the, uh, again an idea of Deuteronomy. Then again comes Menre. Menre, an idea. Menre, okay, this idea. Coming to the Christian idea, Greek academics idea, Greek academical idea of the word, the language, I'll tell you what it is. It is Logos, the might of God, but I can tell you very much. In Christian prayers, it's taught often. Vajana Mamsa Mai Namadele Vasishtra. That was the earlier usage. Word was made flesh. It's a wrong translation. Well, actually, in the Greek process, the word was used eskenesis. Eskenesis. Eskene. Skene means skin. Skenesis. So, we, Namada Namada, we, Namada Namada, Turika deal Kudara Medicine. You got it. We have pitched a tent. The very act of existence we are living here, we have pitched a tent inside of our skin. That's the exact idea of word was made of flesh. This is the idea used by you know Shakespeare or any kind of until 18th century. This idea of literature almost you know they were revolving around this idea of logos. So I have clarified the idea of uh, language I think, to that extent, but it's fine. That would be sufficient. Now we begin the whole process of uh, Heidegger. Why the uh, why there is Heidegger in Akron? It's based on revelation. Okay, revelation. Do you have an idea of revelation? No, we don't teach you revelation, right? Okay. There are two types of language. The whole sorts of language, uh, this whole language source falls under cataphatic. Cataphatic idea of language. And there is another idea, apophatic idea of language. Okay. It's Greek, but fine. Yeah? These are two ideas, okay. And when it comes to the apophatic idea, mostly we call Indian types of language. That is called uh, neti neti, a kind of mantras. It's rhymes and everything comes. And in the prophetic literature and in mantras, we have the, the different rhymes altogether. So it comes around this cataphatic and apophatic idea of language. So it comes around revelation, the idea of very existing, I told you. The first question I told you, why there is something rather than Nothing. And it all comes from idea of revelation. That's very important. That's the particular word. Revelation. When you are born to the world, the world is revealed before you, right? That's the beginning of our existence. Something called a revelation. So there is an a priori, a priori statement for our existence. There is nothing but there is something rather than nothing. Then why you exist here? There is something rather than nothing. I mean, that's the very idea of existence, okay. And this particular question, why you exist here, why you exist here, had been very problematic, very problematic. So people try to answer in several ways. One is philosophy, not in philosophy actually, not in philosophy, I tell you. One way is fideism. That is, you aspire, God created me, so I worship and so on, I have an atheist and so on. Second one is an Aristotelian idea that is scientific. There is more intellectualism that you use the faculty of reason and you understand why you are existing in the world. Fine. So, ever since after this was a long debate going on, okay. This was a long debate going on why you should exist on earth, why you should be here. And Aristotle has an answer, Augustine has an answer, Descartes has an answer, even Heidegger has an answer. Okay. These answers have been based on three parameters. One is your origin. Second is destiny. Third is meaning of existence. Why you should exist? So all the narratives, all existing narratives, either Marxism or anything, anything. Uh, Marxism is uh, actually eschatological interpretation of Judaism. Political eschatological interpretation of Judaism is called Marxism. So based on all these three parameters. What kind of eschatology is very important? Uh, I, uh, I should quote again uh, from uh, Joseph Neuer and Joseph Ratzinger. In those two works, their uh, studies on in eschatology, I'm just giving because it's academics, I'm giving footnote. In their academics, it is told, why, uh, in their observation, I mean, their observation, why there is a large appearance of Marxist ideas.
ideas in the world, what they really interpret, what they really interpret. So it is told, it is told, it is told, in heaven, in heaven, to get heaven, you need to be obedient disciples, obedient citizens here, right? So you just reverse it, just reverse it. Why should you be, I mean, to get heaven, you should be obedient citizens here. So be an obedient citizen here. Just create heaven on earth. Yeah, create heaven on earth. That's the idea of an access. It's just get all the revolution. But yeah, does revolution imply obedience? Revolution comes in a different narrative because in a leftist Hegelian narrative, I'll tell you, when our wife or something, Okay. In Hegelian, I told you why you don't judge in Hegelian, why? Because there is an occurrence, okay? You say, you say, in the, there is an occurrence, there is an occurrence, there is a synthesis. The Hegelians, the Maxians, everybody, take it as a synthesis, okay? There is poverty, fine. There is a poverty, there is a phenomena called a poverty. There is a sudden reaction, it's a synthesis. So it should have an antithesis, right? There is a synthesis and antithesis. So antithesis, you have to again create so many categories. One, agency, agency, so oppression, maybe, you know, all, the patriarchy or kind of, all categories you have to create for this. When there is a poverty, okay? Then, then, then according to the Hegelian idea of dialectics, I'll tell you, dialectics. You should be very careful about that. Dialectics. Why? What is dialectics? What is dialectics? You don't know. There are four types of movements in philosophy. One, syllogism, based on Aristotle. Second is dialectics, bypassed by Aristotle, improvised by Hegel. Then comes what? Rhetorics. Rhetorics, which is very well used by the politicians. Uh, rhetorics, it's a very, uh, rhetorics is the logic of what? Fascism. Rhetorics is the logic of fascism. Whereas, uh, okay, another logic is dialectics. And finally, it is hermeneutics. There are four types of movements in philosophy, and we are not bothered about it because you can't divide it everything in a dialectical movement. No, it, it, it ruptures. There, there is experience. You cannot contain in left because they don't have category. Why left cannot contain category? Because Hegelian, how Hegel separates art, you know. Hegel separates art based on medium. Uh, for him, architecture is an inferior quality of art. Why? It needs a large medium to express. Then comes painting, better than architecture, why? Right? It needs less medium to express. Then comes poetry, poetry doesn't need a medium to express. Okay, this idea of Hegel comes from this, these synthesis and it needs a medium no? to read, read. Poetry, it's an image. Words are in medium. Words, words are written down, yeah. that is, uh, that's fine. Yeah. Poetry is kind of independent speech, speech is on its own. No, I understand, religiously speaking, it is yeah. simpler, but it still has a medium. Okay, and, uh, I agree, but uh, no, okay. idea of poetry, there is an explanation. Okay, but just I told you, that's the idea of revolution comes from that. This is the political interpretation of leftist Hegelian category. It can have an equally appealing uh, interpretation in phenomenology. No, actually, no, even architecture was called frozen music by Nietzsche. Yeah. So even, yeah, there is. Nietzsche was uh, from. Uh, Dionysian uh, idea of yeah. uh, So you got you got the idea. Yeah. 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 Now this comes revelation, idea of revelation. Okay. Very nice. philosophy 
academy. Until Hegel, it was going on. Hegel in academics was very much on. And people are finding the university, they are finding innovations. And so all were obsessed with the Hegelian academics. So one particular guy find, you know, I want a creativity. So he came to India, and Max Miller it is, okay. Because it's the academic innovations, okay. It's not that he was really into the quest of finding what is Indian literature. He wants to have his own place in the academics. So he wanted innovations. But Hegelian and academics had a problem. Had Muller come to India with him? Or he was in Oxford, no? Yeah, he was. He was They're translating on the tour. He did the translation, but uh, there is a story, I don't know whether it's how um, it's, uh, the Indian Sanskrit scholars went to Oxford and began speaking with Muller in Sanskrit, and he couldn't follow what they were saying. So I don't know whether he did come to India. He was a great Indologist, certainly, yes. but I don't know whether he did come to India or not. No, 
now he was uh, recapitulating all the event. He, now, what Heidegger is telling, Heidegger is telling, there is a corruption in whole history. 2000 years ago, Aristotle corrupted the history. Corrupted the history. Yeah, all academic thought processing, it is corrupted. We are thinking in not a right sense. Means we have to go, to back. We have to go yeah. back to Plato. We have, go, we have to go back, not even Plato, pre-Socratics. So what is the fundamental difference between pre-Socratic thought and Socratic thought? Yes, I told you. Pre-Socratic thought are the analysis of being, being versus becoming. Fundamental idea. Me and me on. In okay. Greek. Me and me on. Which, uh, which later Heidegger recaptures. Yeah, yeah, wait, wait, wait. This is answered first by Plato. Second by Aristotle. Being and becoming. This was answered by this was explained by Plato. This there were two groups, two school of thoughts. Zeno, Parmenides. First answered by Plato. That's a mystic mysticism. It's Platonian mysticism, actually. Mostly when it comes to religious narratives, when you analyze religion, phenomenology of religion, religious language, poetry, poetry. You should definitely read minimum Plato, then only you should analyze what poetry. <laughs> okay. Don't otherwise don't read even poetry. But why should I read uh, let me ask a question. Why should I read Plato or anybody if I That's a very nice question. question. I'll tell you. Let me finish. For example, my love is a red, red rose. I can enjoy it. I read about you know one character in Catch and Dato who knew everything about literature except how to enjoy it. So if I can enjoy literature, why should I know all these That's, That's very nice, yeah. very nice question. Yeah. My answer is say when you People breathed long before Joseph Priestley invented this is oxygen, right? Yeah. It's, it's the same question. Yeah. Same question you're asking. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You are answering something concerning the psychologism, the mental status that you can enjoy. That's not the ideal philosophy. We are doing philosophy. Not you, know, you can enjoy, you can have a dopamine rush, you can have an eye effectiveness. That's that's one idea. We enjoy it fine. That's not Philosophy is doing, I'll come to it, I'll come to it. There are two, according to Heidegger, there are two understandings. One is Zuhan, and another is for Han. For Han. And uh, that's answer of Heidegger and Joseph. Okay. Okay. You answer, there is also a dopamine rush you know, when you do philosophy. This is the answer of Heidegger for this question. Shibu, you might have asked a lot of questions in this class. <laughs> 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 yes. Yes. Once I said nihilist, and he said that is from nihilism. I said, we have one meaning for nihilism. You philosophers might have other meaning. Not what I mean, but what I mean. It was quite good. Yeah. 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 So, Zuhan, one thing exists in the existential relationship with others. So you read pay poetry, enjoy, you need not know anything about it. Okay, fine. One thing, second thing, second thing. For hand, for hand, when there is a wind, when there is a wind, you can equally write poetry, romanticize it. And otherwise, I can make use to make it electricity, you know, make use of it to create electricity. That's a for hand way of doing. The whole physics, all the physics and sciences are doing this for hand and height of being. Two ways of approaching. Yeah. 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 You made it so. It's <laughs> not Aristotle corrupted it, I told you. <laughs> That's why there is a corruption of Aristotle. Do you think on those terms? On scientific terms? Or hand terms? Because it's a corruption from Aristotle? Uh, can't you, you think? Uh, can't you equally say that it was the pro pre Socratic people who corrupted it? And Aristotle rectified it. <laughs> Aristotle in his studies. He primarily told about, uh, you know, his idea of being, his idea of being. One is, you know, you have essence, act, and uh, potence. When you analyze an art form, a painting, a painting, a genre, again you have a binary, something similar to it, a form and content. This is the corruption. You can't think, you know, all the categories. Are, see, I'll tell you one, another thing, you know. But the problem with the uh, Aristotelian language, Aristotelian language, Aristotle can have only four types of, uh, I mean, uh, I mean, Mary loves Peter, 
Peter. Peter loves Mary. Peter loves Mary. I take a sentence. And Peter, another one is predicate. Yeah. Yeah. But it's not correct. Because it's not, it's not a quality of the Peter. It's not the quality of the Peter. So, when it comes, I'll tell you, when it comes to a new idea of language of frage, frage, you have to say, there is a function called a laugh. Or a function f, x, y. Okay. There is a function called a laugh. And x, y, you have to write Peter, Mary. And this is not conceived in Aristotle. Because for you it's a predicate. They are equally qualified. Peter and Mary are actually equally qualified. But Aristotelian idea of substance, corruption of substance, corruption of substance. So you're saying it is wrong to say Peter loves Mary. <laughs> Peter loves Mary. It's Aristotelian way of understanding is wrong. I'm asking according to Aristotle, Aristotle it's okay. No, the no problem when it comes to, I'm telling you why, I tell you, when it comes to the logic, when we analyze the propositions, when we create new proposition, complexity of propositions, to analyze its truth value, or to, you know, make it more of, you know, set value theories. No, but still, I don't understand what's wrong in its sentence. Yeah, <laughs> What is wrong if Peter's loving uh, Mary? Or Mary what else Peter. do you say? <laughs> Peter loves her. Damn it. <laughs> okay, okay they love each other, then it is a Peter and Mary love each other. Yeah. Then is it okay for you then? <laughs> Man, it's a quality of the Peter. I the problem then. Yeah. It's a quality of the predicate of the Peter. Okay, what? Okay. According to, now I'll tell you, why I'll tell you, because a substance, a substance, according to Aristotle, what is the corruption I'll tell you? Corruption I'll tell you. It has an essence, right? Yeah. It has a habitus. The habitus is called actually the loves, according to Aristotle. Okay. Yeah? It has a space, it has a time, it has you know, all those ten categories are there. Based on you learn noun, adjective, this whole structure of language is Aristotelian. Okay, fine. That's the problem. So what do we do now? The problem comes. <laughs> 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 I, I, I won't say <laughs>
മഴ പെയ്യുന്നു എന്ന വാക്കിന് എന്തെങ്കിലും പ്രശ്നമുണ്ടോ പെയ്യുന്നതാണ് മഴ Hegel, this is a German idealism. Uh, you know, they are armchair philosophy. 
their armchair philosophy, armchair philosophy. So, but the reality is what? There is a fluorescence. We make love or kind of we read, we eat, we breathe, we have hunger. These are practical issues. They're never they are not never the matters of philosophy. In Hegelian, there is nothing about hunger, right? Hegel, nothing about hunger. So he told that there is a corruption began with, you know, the ethos of characters are basic one, epistemic. When he felt hunger, he ran away, you know, yeah. because that's when Napoleon came and yeah, he had this book. He was he was he was away, yeah. Yeah. Second one is Euonia. Third one is Dionysus. You should be very careful about all these trees. You do MA for the epistemic engagement. You do any theorization, it's for the epistemic engagement. And if you qualified epistemically, you say you are as qualified as you know, somebody else, I don't know. Ivonia, Ivonia, because you should have an idea of the world. That's the idea. It's a Greek idea, it's from Aristotle. Nicomachean ethics, this idea of us. And Heidegger too. Why the corruption occurs in Western academics? It's only based on epistemic knowledge. It's only based on epistemic engagement. It's supposed to be on phronesis, that is practical wisdom. A politician need not be epistemically qualified, but in phronesis he is qualified than anybody else. So practical wisdom. Based on phronesis, he deconstructs the entire uh, paradigm of uh, Western. You got it? Now you got the way the corruption came. What is the problem with it? So this was actually happened with the... <laughs> can, you, can you give some examples? You know, you are saying that Aristotle was responsible for the corruption. Okay. And because all he, all, he very much relied on epistemic. For example, can you say? In, in the case of... Yeah. Acquiring a degree. Okay. Academic knowledge. Academic knowledge. See, when it comes to the morality, morality, yeah. moral philosophy, it's synthesizes. Racist, that uh, uh, we have a natural law that everything is for the good, you know, destiny should be good. Anything that is justified by the good. Okay. This is issue. When the problem comes very well, when it comes to the, you take an example of prostitution, it is an intrinsic key. According to some, but not according to everyone. Not I am telling you. No, according to Aristotle, it is evil. Not it is evil. Yeah, but, is evil. Yeah. No, but, no. <laughs> I am telling the principles in the races. Principles in the races. Everything is destined to be good. Mm. You find we want to appreciate the goodness of individual. Mm. That's why there is morality. Mm. It's not a category. I, I tell you, it's not a categorical imperative. You know, any discipline needs to have a categorical imperative. Any needs. And he doesn't. Uh, in morality, we don't have a categorical imperative. Probably there is interaces. That is appreciation of good. That is interaces. When it comes to explanation of uh, free will, I mean, in the biblical story, uh, uh, we make choice and everything. Uh, ha, Aristotle hard to say. It is hard to say. There is an ongoing determinism in Aristotle. So he told there is a possibility of free will because his narrative collapses there. That's why there is a problem with the epistemic engagement because purely. Epistemically, it should be correct. Message. It should be based on phronesis. So, I have pray everything is okay, fine. And uh, I tell you one thing there is something called a Russian formalism. It applied Husserlian, Husserl's uh, phenomenology. phenomenology. And their idea was uh, mechanics of text. Mechanics of text. So, they had to create a new term called uh, literariness. Right? This an analysis of literature. So the idea of Aristotelian idea of mimesis, representation of the text, or uh, all things, you know, they do away with. Because they apply the phenomenology to the literary studies. Now I am speaking about applying Heideggerian academics to the literature. You got it? It means a departure from formalism. Yeah, and formalism is a what? Husserl, the idea of Husserl. Yeah, the mechanical. Mechanical thing. Now I told you a very well idea and uh, for Heidegger, the very existence of being in the world is to interpret. Your existence in the world only to interpret. Okay. Because you have a thornus in the beginning, try to understand. There is a work first here, you have an understanding. So, if there is a hermeneutical circle, hermeneutical cycle, understanding, interpretation, 
interpretation then this is a cycle okay so hermeneutical cycle coined by so what it is uh, according to i mean classical theories and so on interpretation comes last right but for heidegger interpretation comes first got it so i will come to the very idea of uh, every understanding has a for stand for understanding Every understanding has it, I and mean, it's a bit not tough actually. You're doing it in every in your, in your everyday life. You're doing yeah, it okay. because I told you this phronesis. It is practical. He was philosophizing what is practical. You're doing it every day, but the way of doing language, he was creating a kind of a different way of doing language. Uh, this is my kind of idea. So uh, because he has an idea of Dasein, Dasein is very 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 problematic idea. I don't want to complicate you. Nothing of that sort. <laughs> and Heidegger himself didn't uh, finish his project because in the Manium Opus, uh, uh, being on time is an unfinished project. Fine, it is, and uh, as all, it is. Uh, design is interpretatory. Design has an interpretive tendency. Okay, so the fundamental failures of design is to interpret. That is the theoretical foundation for Heidegger. So hitherto existing, whatever so far existing understanding are around these things now. How these things happen, you know, not in a, you said, no interpretation happens towards the end. But it all happens, you know, we are not sure when interpretation, it happens side by side, you know. Mm -hmm. It's almost a simultaneous kind, kind of process. Mm -hmm. Not going to take, you know, this furnace, which you said, you have understood it correctly. And epistemic, they are not, you know, watertight compartments. This will be also... It's not so linear, you yeah. know, it's not linear. Or, I will to speak that. Yeah. 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 Okay. <laughs> 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 There's a existing idea of understanding. One is epistemic. Giving scientific foundation using intelligence. That's interpretation. It has to exist. Interpretations. That's why. Right. And the universal hermeneutics. Be home with something that is a facticity. Athletic, you know, an athletic understand soccer. We understand to care and nothing with people. What I mean to say, it's like uh, we all understand everything in one, some sort of way, and we want to make it intelligible primarily. Second, I told you for hand and kite. You want to make useful. You want to make it productive. You want to, you know, use it uh, kind of, you know, usefulness of something. You are usefulness of. You always you will learn literature, literary productions. Why you learn probably to create a data bank so the robot can create uh, literature. <laughs> kind of idea that was existing paradigm that's going on. So there's a transparency of interpretation. I don't want to get into the very much details into it. Unfolding, I have told you. Interpretation helps for understanding. I told you. Hermetic circle, I have told you already. There is a four structure for grounding and dialogue. From this, from this hermeneutic cycle, I told you have a four understanding. There comes a four firstian understanding. Then there is a grounding, Ubgrund, according to him, grounding. Then it begins to dialogue. Only then you begin to have a dialogue. For him, for him. Uh, you can disagree, but uh, no. <laughs> because I have issue with Heidegger, I, I really have issue with Heidegger in some way, but it's fine. But it's fine. Uh, hermeneutics dismantles the tradition and conceals everything, making philosophical hermeneutics a uh, danger for so. Okay, leave it. Now I come to uh, Gadama. Gadama, I tell again Gadama, then I will finish it off. Why? I told you what is clarification, then I told Heidegger in academics, then I am speaking on hermeneutics. I just skip all the history because it began with Philo, Augustine, Droysen, Schleiermacher, then Dilte, everybody. I, I skipped it all because it's expected that it's the minimum PG students are here. It's supposed to have a uh, recapitulation of concepts. Okay, that's cool. <laughs> then comes uh, your what is existingly doing in your academics is exegesis. But in our present day classrooms, they are doing exegesis, that is interpretation primarily. There is also a probability for extirpetation. Okay. There is something called extirpetation. What is it? I will tell you. So, you know, there is a only kite, first time, and everything, problem of exegesis and avoidance. So, interpretation, extirpetation, because, because, 
So you know the very classical example of a constructivist theory that is, I am a liar paradox, you know it. <laughs> I am a liar. You can't prove it. The Cretan paradox. Yeah, Cretan paradox. You know its uh, implications? There is something called a logical positivism of Rudolf Carnap and everyone. <coughs> Vienna circle. It collapsed. How? How it collapsed? Among them, there was a guy called uh, Kurt Gödel. Kurt Gödel. He translated this Cretan paradox into mathematics. So it came to be everything cannot have, cannot have proof. In mathematics, many things they don't have proof. That's the implications. And that is an authoritarian language. That's the problem with the language. Language collapses on its own weight. It cannot, you know. There comes the interpretation that how you really the experience. What is experience from inside you have experience, experience, external impression on your being, expression. So you need to have an extrapolation, a kind of an idea. Is it to be you know it's sort of more in the work of Raymond of Panikar and so on? Uh, he takes up, he develops this idea, you know, trying to uh, so when it comes to the question, there comes two ideas. One is Raiden, Raiden, then second one is Strahan. This is normal speech we make, we make. Read it, it's an, I told you already, it's ontological way of speaking, ontological existential constitution we speak. So, it's, uh, in this, when it comes to the idea, you know, uh, it reached here, it reached here. Then Gadamer uh, published his book, Truth and Method. Truth and Method. on the Method. And this and is not disjunctive because he was proving that whatever existing hitherto, Western academics had gone wrong because you had a wrong method. The truth is outside because you had a wrong method. So, and you have to have a new method. That's this and presupposes. And uh, he solves it into one aesthetics, aesthetic hermeneutics. Second is. is Disjunctive. Disjunctive. Yeah, it is taller. As a same what I just spoke. The existing, so far existing methods in Western, it cannot contain food. For example, take an Indian literature kind of, you know, Indian classical dance forms. It is never intelligible to the Western academics. That's what it is for. Why? Because you had a wrong method. One example I give. You had a wrong method. So he tells, one is aesthetics, he saw this hermeneutics in you have three levels. One is definitely aesthetics, second history, one is language. This is comes the language, literary academics, language, one idea language. It coins to the linguality, idea of linguality, phenomenologically, linguality. So the universal method of historical understanding, it is against Hegel. He creates a method against Hegelian academics because it's a universal, universal method of doing. It's not Hegelian method. It's a hermeneutical method. You are supposed to follow a hermeneutical method in all your when you do a dissertation. What you are supposed to do? You have to do a hermeneutical method, not a Hegelian method. Exactly, kind of an idea. Uh, then, secondly, it creates. It, uh, now the hermeneutics becomes a kind of a scientific. A reliable method for literature, doing literature. Hermeneutics is the only way to do literature. And very important it is. And thirdly, the universal element of re de regionalization is called language. Universal. Right? Anything that's connects the world is language, it equally de regionalizes. Language equally de that is called a linguality, which made the matter. Uh, now, from this one particular interpretation, uh, it becomes like a reader and author doesn't have any authority on the text. It's one, I'm giving an example. It comes from this linguality. This proposition comes from this idea of uh, linguality, not from any idea, sort of idea. Actually, uh, all these days I was trying to make it simple, but still I, I couldn't communicate everything possible because it's very, the time is very less, secondly.
And uh, you said that uh, it de regionalizes. How can anything be de regionalized? Uh, it's again a uh, way of doing a language. It's like uh, you're gonna, there's something called the Babel myth. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, see, the primary issue for us is descriptive. Something Even like the Tower of Babel is not de regionalized. That's what? Yeah. There we bring, that's a Platonian idea, Babel myth. It's a Platonian idea. And we want to say, Anything you will see, the existing Western academics of language seems to become a kind of an, there is an importancy concerning the scientific academics. It doesn't create anything new, that's what I mean. There is a development of science and there is a development of technology. In Heideggerian terms, technology is the essence of being. Okay? Technology is the essence of being. The very much, even if you try or not, even if you, you know, have strike against computers, it will overrule you. Kind of technology is the essence of being that is called even Heidegger has its own, his own idea of techne, techne for you know. Uh, in Aristotle, you know, there are several ideas like one, there are several types of poetry and several uh, grades. One is techne, then comes mimesis, then comes poiesis. In poiesis, we have the idea of act and potency actually. Then comes the cathartic function, kataro, katare, katarezi, you know, kind of ideas that's primarily ritual for the idea of tragedy and so on. So in all these, in all these ideas, you know, it, it's practically important. Why do we do that? Why do we read at all? Why do we? All those humanitarian questions arise concerning the question of technology. It becomes only hope of Western scientific academics. And for Heidegger, if there is a salvation anywhere, it's only in art. <laughs> for Heidegger, if there is a resurrection to this humanity, if there is something in hopeful to the reality can find only in arts. So he's creating, you know, <coughs> against all this scientific discourse, he is creating a hermeneutical, scientific idea first here, a theoretical support, you can only found in art. In Hegelian method, you cannot reach this conclusion, that you can have salvation in art. But in Heidegger's method, you can arrive in a conclusion. So there the language plays a vital role, it's not a post-structuralist idea, it's a cataphatic idea of the language that's revealed, revealed and concealment, alathei, according to Heidegger, constantly revealed before you, that particular language they are bringing How do you connect it to Plato's idea of art? Plato's idea of art, you know, in the beginning of uh, Platonian academics, you should have a different idea coming into the Plato. When Plato developed their metaphysics, when they developed their metaphysics, you know, many people develop metaphysics, they should answer everything, you know. Why do we exist? Why there is something? What is art? What is not art? Why people breathe? Everything should be answered. You know? According to metaphysical understanding, everything should be, you know. And for, I mean, both of them, you know, uh, Aristotle and Plato, the fundamental question they had, I mean, okay, fine, you told there is a being and becoming. What is art? How do we answer? Why there should be art at all? It's just a matter of psychologism. Or this is, there is a metaphysical idea, metaphysical concerns. How, you know, when it comes to the painting, according to the Aristotle, when it comes to you analyze a painting, there is a form and matter, form and matter, okay, form and uh, ma uh, content and matter, okay. So if it is a real shoe, take a shoe, take a shoe, there is a form designed by, and matter of a leather, and sort of, that is caused by who? A uh, cobbler, fine. When it comes to the painting of the shoes, you have a form, what is the matter? That's a question actually asked by Aristotle. And Aristotle had an answer, I mean, uh, it is revisited again and again. So when it comes to the, see, one more thing I forgot to tell you. What is the Heideggerian method of doing philosophy? Subjective. No, 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 so I'm telling you method, method. Here is Plato, Aristotle, okay. How you want to know Plato, you know? No, you are, you are not supposed to read Plato directly. At least all of a sudden you have Heidegger, then read Hegel, then read Kant, then read uh, Descartes, then do all the scholasticism, then you reach here. Why? Because you started with Aristotle. No, if I told you want to, you have to go to reverse. For what I am trying to understand is Heidegger, uh, if I understood you correctly, he wanted to say that uh, the idea of language okay. is not On me, on, uh, see, on me, on, 
See, yeah, no, you know, I got, I got your point. I know you come back. I know. Uh, so uh, in Plato, we have this idea, idea meaning there and then life meaning. Uh, the remote is on that and then art, right? Okay. So uh, my question was, where do we place language in the? That is a fundamental language? issue. See, even in Aristotle, category, there is no place for language. That's what. In Aristotle, yes. But in Plato, we had all this already categorized, right? Everything no. was here in Plato. When Aristotle tried to justify art, no, no, then no. came the question. There is a problem with problem with Aristotle. See, primary issue is not art or nothing. They have issue with metaphysics. With? Metaphysics. Their primary... And that's what Plato was thinking about when he was talking about ideas, right? No, no, no. no. He spoke idea, about idea, not because to say speak about art. They have nothing to do with art. I agree. What I am telling you, <laughs> primarily they are speaking metaphysics. See, you should have a, a valid reason to explain everything. There you can express what is science, what is art, what is everything. So, since, uh, because our uh, area of study is what? And literature, we rely on Plato, his own expression, that's all. It's reverse, in reverse. It's not Plato. See, in ongoing debate, ongoing debate, keep on debating, then there is a language, language, there is a uh, keeps on taking from Plato, there is a keeps on taking from Plato, and there are issues with the actually Greek language. I'll tell you what is the primary issue. Greek language has Ioris to uh, no, Hebrew language, for example, Hebrew language. In the ancient Hebrew language has only two tenses. Yeah, Arabic how it is? Past tense and present tense. Present, present tense, tense is there, right? Yeah, present tense. For Hebrew, there is no present tense. Yeah. It's also used for future tense. For Hebrew people, Hebrew language, there is no present tense. Only past tense. In Greek, the idea is different. And language idea is different. So it has a severe issue with the language itself. Language itself. So, what, according to Heidegger, we don't know how they used it. They, are there words for arts? There are no words for arts. No. In Arist even in Aristotle, there is no word for art. No. Actually, no. Okay. Even Plato, the primary, their only issue was why should you know why somebody should perform a uh, drama? How it relates? Right? They should justify it. You know why? I, so he tells us uh, we have intrinsic tendency of imitation. That's what is primarily. His categorical imperative of art is we have a primary tendency of imitation, which is not true. That's why uh, Aristotle intervenes. Aristotle tells no. Aristotle, <laughs> according to Techne, using set of rules, you can uh, make a sculpture. It's not exactly mimesis, Techne. Then comes mimesis, some sort of mimesis there. Then comes poiesis. Poiesis means you create something out of nothingness. Because in the matter of the shoe, matter of the shoe in a painter, it's out. matter is not same. That's what Aristotle, that's a form and matter theory. You got it, kind of idea. So, such a metaphysical difference actually they have. That's what. So, okay, when we say uh, Plato was speaking about imitation, but it has a different idea actually, Plato had, because uh, the idea of catharsis, in Katharo, there are three types of catharsis, katare, katharos. Three ideas are there. Primarily, ritual purgation. Ritual purgation in Plato, and uh, pharmaceutical remedy in Aristotle. I mean, what I want to tell you, when you read Greek text, it's different. The structure of language is different. Structure of language, the very idea they propose, which is different. Because I was learning exegesis, biblical exegesis, primarily I dealt with the Greek language. Greek language, I mean, when it comes to the law, eschenesis, I told you, for example, eschenesis. It has a different idea altogether, eschenesis, or a sort of, uh, which, logos, again, different. I mean, there are several Greek terms, even. When you analyze the Greek, the structure, why there was occurrence of a particular thing, it's not art at all. They never had an idea of art. You know? When it comes to, at a particular point, if I asked Plato, why Iliad was written? So, Plato has one interpretation. Aristotle has another interpretation. Throughout this, we have different interpretation. When the Heidegger, it has again a different interpretation. So, are you saying that uh, when you read 
question you get. It's a very different understanding you get from uh, when you read it in English. So we should not no. be teaching in English translation. Mm -hmm. It is not my fault. When they read that, it's mm -hmm. the same. Because he takes one particular Greek term, pharmacon. Uh, yeah, yeah. Greek language is different, it is. It's completely different. No. Even Heidegger works are primarily for separating only in Greek. Never yeah, that's what I was trying to ask you. I was planning to ask you because Heidegger had German language yeah. and the works written in German language in his mind when he was writing. So, uh, but we are reading Heidegger in English. In English. I don't know, maybe you are reading it in English. <laughs> so, is it possible to understand Heidegger in all its complexity no. through English? No. no. For him, uh, English is an uh, analytical language, yeah. primarily. And even Greek language, he never supplies even translation. He uses Greek as Greek. Yeah. Greek yeah, yeah. or English, we call it. Even when it was... Uh, uh, but, uh, you know, you mentioned that actually in his writing, he is the big of Derrida. He said Derrida actually unnecessarily complicated the thing. For example, when King Lear in that particular thing says that unbutton my... Everybody understands what he says, but the is unnecessarily drawing us, you know, into the various meanings of button and going on to say that, you know, it's like a carpet, zone, there is what he, what he calls semantic slipperiness everywhere. Such semantic slipperiness is not there in our everyday life. If such semantic slipperiness existed in everyday life, nothing would have been possible. In practical, I told you, friends, you have to understand, friends intellectually in a different yeah. manner. Just yeah. for, uh, for example, you talked about Arabic. Arabic, you are right in that uh, it doesn't have, you know, the three tenses. But Arabs can easily distinguish between, you know, present tense and future tense. Because, and, uh, you know, for example, some languages like Hanunu, I think, used in Philippine, there's only four color words. And there were people who said, you know, these people are color blind. Because there are only four color words. But later it was proven that, you know, using these four color words, using some you know, prefixes and suffixes they couldn't actually understand. So that kind of radical difference that we say that exists between Greek and modern English might not actually be there, that might be illusory. That claim can also be made. It is true. But I'll tell you, there is another guy called Wittgenstein. Wittgenstein. Yeah. And, and in later Wittgenstein, later Wittgenstein, language is the architect of reality. Language is the architect of reality. That's a wonderful quotation. Very good quotation. And also at the same time, you know, this Wittgenstein, you know, also said, I think, quite nutty things. Because when he was uh, talking with uh, Professor Ham, you know, I, I can't understand all these lofty things, that's why I'm coming here. Because uh, uh, Russell asked him, would you say that there is no rhinoceros in this room? Wittgenstein said, no, I can never say that there is no rhinoceros in the room. So that kind of things, I find it nutty. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> yeah, it gets time, I mean. They were all working on Frege, they were working on the propositions. You know. It's not the question we in the literature. See, language, fine, language in itself, why I tell you. The issue of Wittgenstein uh, was where exactly the issue? What has to be solved? Which will be hidden from you? Something like air. You know, we have to purify the air, but we don't know we are breathing. Kind of so, language, the problem actually there is in language. Actually, there is a problem in language, but if you don't solve it, all the thought process you are expressing in that language will be problematic. So, they are all into the philosophy of language, philosophy of language, and, and uh, Wittgenstein has a different turn altogether in language studies, you know, when you learn semiotics, Julia Kristeva, when you, if you learn Julia Kristeva, it comes, the semiotic comes from Aristotelian rhetorical semiotics. When you learn the Rida, the semiotics, the idea of language comes from Augustinian semiotics. Yeah. Augustinian semiotics. So, their idea of language, what they are trying to uh, is the, exp the experience, the experience, how you can completely express in language, because of language it has a limitation. He was trying to prove it. Language, has, it is a limitation now, according to the Rida. According to the Rida, any philosophy you make, it's bullshit. Why? You don't have an adequate language to express. That's what there is. A, trying to prove, so there is a slippery. Why there is a problem with the language? But that will also include, 
Self-implicating, no? It is, it is. That's what I'm telling you. Because even the genetic battle, everybody takes, they have an argument. And they collapse on its own. The Cretan paradox. I, you can't prove in language, I am a liar. Everything collapses there. Even Derrida, French intellectualism. To collapse on its own. That's where the hermeneutic comes for the resurrection. You know? That's why the hermeneutic is very powerful. Because Derrida is again hopeless. You, there is no point in you are expressing something in language. Or Miguel Unamano, 
all those people have a deep study on mysticism, mystical experience. Mystical experience is different from religious experience. All things have its own uh, Karl Barth. Then uh, we have to differentiate it from again transcendentalism. Okay, so there are three things coming to the individual. One is a philosophy of life. Second thing is a Weltan Shaum. You should need to have a Weltan Shaum. Then you must understand your place in universe. These three paradigms create an idea of mysticism. And it has a mystical experience and it has some categories. That's how the academics works. No, you can continue. I'm telling you this again. Uh, then it comes to the, this Edith Stein. She has spoken on phenomenology of mysticism. Okay. Edith Stein. She was a contemporary and classmate of Heidegger. Uh, phenomenology of spirit. She was a mystic. Uh, one more thing before I continue, uh, one more thing I want to tell you. Actually, have you heard of deconstruction in Africa? Decreation, have you heard of? It was spoken by whom? Simone Weil. Simone, Simone Weil. Weil. Uh, Simone Weil, Simone Weil in his Grace and Gravity, she pro proposes how this process based on the idea of decreation. Okay. It's not that somebody already coined an idea. In whole academics, it was very much in the air about deconstruction, destruction, decreation. She takes the idea of decreation, and in her writings, there is a sort of mysticism, but she uh, takes the principles of extremes. She tells there is a principles of extremes, and she takes this idea. Okay, now you can. Julius Wellhausen. 
He was a scholar who proposed this idea concerning Torah because Torah has four parts. So when you analyze Torah, you will have so many parts of the Torah is Yahist tradition. By I told it. Means Pentateuch has five, no? Pentateuch is five. Yeah. But Torah actually, it is there. Yeah. But uh, some parts are like you know Yahist original occurrence of yeah. the plot. One is the flight of Joseph. Flight of Joseph. Joseph. I told you Shakespearean plot to be consider. We try to uh, Kafka original plot. No. So it's a Hegelian idea of uh, appropriating. So it told some parts of the Pentateuch, some parts of Torah. It looks like it is a Yahwist tradition. It has what? It has a patronage of king. No, that's what Hegelian. You know, the production of literature comes from the patronship, right? So it comes from the idea. Of, <laughs> okay. Yeah, this. Then you have uh, Elohist tradition. Elohist tradition. God Himself speaks in certain passage. In Adam and Eve, God in search of man. Right? Yeah, yeah, you know. yeah. So all those parts. So it, it is a it's good one. God in search of man. Yeah. yeah. Uh, <laughs> so how it happens? God is speaking like a man. You know. What kind of imagination is it? What? So it might be written by a kind of uh, uh, ordinary man, ordinary people, uh, because ordinary people have a pop cult form of faith. Pop cult form of faith. Okay, okay. So they would write this way. Fine. Then comes the De uh, Deuteronomy stone. Deuteronomy. There is Torah, covenant, law. Any community needs a law. So there is a law. You got it? It's a Hegelian. Because any community needs law. Yes. Again, Hegelian, according to Hegelian, those who left to me, who corrupts the whole world? Priesthood. Uh -huh. <laughs> That's why you don't like Hegel. <laughs> no, 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 it's a job. Like, it's a job. 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 It's a they give uh, you know, a kind of a structure to everything. Structure to everything. They are a priestly coloring to everything. Priestly coloring to everything. They made a ritual. So, any criteria? It's a Hegelian narrative. But it has a severe issue. Severe issue. Because it's not possible. You know, a kind of uh, a literature comes together, editing in the. Because this priest is Ezra. Ezra. Uh, editing in the academy. One particular piece is not possible. Then, because there are two accounts of creation. Problem with that. The problem with this particular uh, academics. The two accounts of creation there. And there is a Sara. Sara is supposed to be, uh, she has several gods, idea and so on. So we create, uh, move on to Hegelian. It, uh, it, there is a rupture. We can't fulfill all the complications in the Pentateuch. There are so many complications in Pentateuch. So many repetitions. So many issues. So it cannot be these four sources. So we move on to the redactive criticism. <laughs> we go on to redactive criticism. We say, who edited this particular text? Oh, he made all these issues. Yeah. Then somebody told them, no, it's not again, it's not okay. It's not okay, what is the problem? Then we move on to textual criticism. Because original texts are not available. We are making all the conversion based on texts already available. A textual criticism. Then comes the very idea of Fragmentary hypothesis. Okay, so in the fragmentary hypothesis, new academics, fragmentary hypothesis, when we analyze the same text, we analyze, we analyze the same text, then we say it is impossible to have this particular text. It's not possible to have this in particular text. In other words, text. we create our own problems. Uh, no, <laughs> no, yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <sense. I> mean, <laughs> so it's more based on uh, fragmentary hypothesis. Then we say, yeah, definitely. There is, there is only two sources. One is priestly and non-priestly sources. Only two sources can exist. Only two sources can exist in this particular idea. And when, when people of Egypt, they were in slavery in Egypt, when they came to land of Canaan, they had an Amphictyonic confederation according to the 1950s, according to the academics of Martin North. You know, two, two Martins influenced me. One is Martin North. Second Martin Heidegger. According to Martin North, according to Martin North, they were they an Amphictyonic order. Then they have Gottinger model of analysis. And presently we have a phenomenological way of doing things. This is how graduation comes.
So Hegra cannot satisfy this. Okay. One example I told you. Yeah, yeah. Yes. Even comes to the theodicy. Theodicy. Yes. Uh, when it comes to theodicy, there is a marginalization of uh, a kind of a uh, God concept. Yeah. Because Sarah and Rachel, they were found with God. And how the Yah predicate? Judaism is monotheistic religion. How? In originally, it is not monotheistic religion. Judaism. Judaism had 12 tribes. 12 tribes had 12 gods. First is slave tribes. When it comes to the land of Canaan, the final tribe migration was of Joseph tribe. Joseph tribe. They created the cult of Yahweh. They created the cult of Yahweh. Provided, provided, provided. He was saying, restore our slavic narrative. And they created an idol of Kaf. That's a different narrative, not really. Vidyamish narrative. So coming to Martin North would say it is not Pentateuch. Only first four books are part of the book. Fifth is uh, let it go. It is a summary of all these books, according to Martin North. And present idea of Pentateuch, I will tell you. One is by P. Greenwine. Green wine. P. Greenwine told them. When they went to Assyria, ex exilation, to get a religious freedom, the authority asked them, what is your idea? What is your religion? What is your constitution? They saw their work for a temple people hypothesis is there. Second hypothesis, second kind of hypothesis is a folklore hypothesis. Any, any people on the formation of a tribe, they will have a folklore, they will have a folklore, they will have a feasts, tribal myths, uh, all this constituted uh, to existing academics moves on uh, temple theory. Temple theory. Torah was written for the religious freedom, for the constitution. See how from Hegelian to here, how it is. Yeah, yeah. So, even our own text, yeah, I mean, when we study our own literature, uh, it not even reach the hermeneutics, I think. Not even reach. And so really, you see, there is a Maxian collection here because it doesn't contain the reality, it doesn't contain the experience. It cannot contain, it cannot contain. But I don't know how I still like the hermeneutics, you really get into it. Please have the final I had a question, this Please. last question. Uh, you mentioned that uh, most philosophers are not concerned with like practical subjects, things that concern the common man. I mean, uh, it's other uh, subjects. Uh, but is, uh, can you shed light on a way in which, you know, did Heidegger ever have, like, can his philosophy be applied in practical ways or any other philosophy? See what I was telling you. They all created narratives. They all created narratives. Which, see, when you analyze something, you have a logical process called razor's edge. Occam's razor's edge. Have you come, come across this? Yes. What is it? Razor's edge. What is it? Do you know what I can't really recall. Okay. Those are, uh, when, when, there are one or more narratives concerning one particular reality, the simplest of the simplest one. Okay. Ah. It's like you have a heliocentrism, heliocentrism, and to what are those kind of words and resources? A geocentrism, I don't know about So, for geocentrism, there is 10 theories. For heliocentrism, there is only one theory. When Euclid developed for geocentrism, according to the basis edge theory, there are so many abnormalities in astronomy and so on and so on. Opt for the symbol. That is heliocentrism. Once you accept heliocentrism, one, that one particular narrative problem is solved. In the same way, all these philosophers, all these philosophers are doing their philosophy to have a recapitulation of the reality. To make intelligible the very reality. Why do we exist? What is the meaning of life? The original three patterns, everything. All have, you know, Hegel has a different idea. Hegel told, Hegel took up the uh, dialectical logic. Uh, Aristotle took up syllogistic logic. No, all have different logics all together. And when it comes to the one particular idea of a reality, uh, there are no explanation. So, it was so far. In Heidegger, Heidegger, to an extent, he has idea of Welton, I mean, world life. World life, its own concept, and secondly, based on phronesis, he makes sense of it. 
why do we eat and definitely we are, but philosophizing everything. He has propositions, his idea, because it's based on phronesis. Because that's very idea. I told him it's not physics. He told it's physics. We are doing physics. A kind of he becomes ontic and ontological. This ontic means uh, uh, regular affairs. So once you should have a grounding, grounding, grun in metaphysics, then you should have an upgrund, subgrounding in practical life. That's very ideal. Thanks. Do we have any other questions?